Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Reference Recordings. And today we're talking about Mahler's First Symphony. Now, this is another one of those, well, I keep saying every one of these things is interesting, but it's true. Each reference recording has its own story, its own place in the repertoire of the work and in the history of the piece on disc. And so this one, I think, is kind of nifty. I mean, they're all kind of nifty, but yes, it's definitely nifty because Mahler's first um, always had a few recordings. People tended to do the first and the fourth when they did Mahler at all, right? So we know which symphonies were the most popular ones, but Mahler was not popular. And you really couldn't have a reference recording until Mahler had broken out of the the Mahler cult ghetto um, and become sort of a wider commodity until there was a body of recordings that people could consider and also um, a wider audience willing to consider them. So the initial batch of Mahler firsts, at least in, in you know, the, from the 1950s or so on, consisted of Bruno Walter twice. He did a mono and a stereo and the mono one is better than the stereo one and it's fantastic could very easily have been a reference recording, but it wasn't in print because it was eclipsed by the slightly less interesting stereo one. Leonard Bernstein was doing Mahler, but his Mahler was, you know, first of all, his Mahler first, the first one anyway, was, was not as good as his later Deutsche Grammophon remake either. He waited because Bruno Walter had done a stereo remake and he was very gracious about it. He said, well, I'm not going to do the first then for a little while. And then when he did it, people were not as thrilled with it as they might have been. You know, Heitink and the Concertgebouw, his first Mahler first, two of them with the Concertgebouw. His first one was was rather tame and uninteresting. His remake was excellent. That is true. But that only came later in the 70s. And so, you know, the, the situation with Mahler one was such that there wasn't going to be a, a a generally agreed consensus about which the great ones were. Schulte's first one with the LSO was marvelous. That was probably the best of the batch back in the day. It really was. But um, it was with the London Symphony Orchestra, and Schulte with the LSO was not the hot commodity that Schulte later became um, when he moved to Chicago. And of course, he was known principally as an opera conductor for doing the ring and that stuff, which was, you know, made his reputation. Um, it was absolutely excellent. But again, Mahler, the fact that he was doing Mahler, he doesn't get a lot of credit for doing Mahler because some of it was lousy. But his first and his ninth particularly were superb um, with the London Symphony. And it really was, you know, Mahler was starting to emerge. He was emerging, but there was no consensus because he wasn't known well enough. And so the first symphony had to wait. It had to wait until 1968 before the reference recording popped up. And it was this one. It was Kubelik with the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra. Now, Raphael Kubelik, of course, was a known quantity on both sides of the Atlantic. He was a respected conductor. His work with Bavarian Radio was was, you know, interesting to say the least and very good, but it wasn't getting promoted by Deutsche Grammophon the way, you know, Carrion and those people were in the 60s. Um, so he was doing a Mahler cycle and this Mahler cycle was the least well-known and probably least respected overall of the great Mahler cycles in the works. Those being, of course, Bernstein, and then there was Schulte, who eventually got to Chicago, but, you know, he had been doing them, and Heitink with the Kitzerkebel, and there was, of course, a Bravanel in Utah, which was a very local, you know, U.S. sort of thing. But those were the Mahler cycles that were going on, and this one was, was sort of flying under the radar. It really was. And frankly, I'm um, taken as a whole, it's a solid, consistent Mahler cycle, but it's a bit underwhelming. And, you know, since we've released Kubelik's, um, Audita released almost uh, almost an entire Mahler cycle live, and he was so much better live than he was in the studio, with this exception. There were some fine performances in this Mahler cycle, actually. I think, I think numbers one and three and four and five and, well, let's say nine were very good. Some of the others were more tepid, but that's okay. We don't have to go there. We're not going through Mahler cycles. We're only talking about the first symphony. The characteristics of Kubelik's Mahler fit the first symphony perfectly. 
because Kubelik's Mahler was fresh and swift, and it emphasized what you might call the, the Czech rustic elements in, his, in, in Mahler, you know, the woodwind section and that kind of stuff. The Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra was really a second tier ensemble, however much they'd improved since their 1950s incarnation under Jochum and those guys. I mean, they were steadily getting better. They really were. Um, and the playing here is quite good. The Sonics are, you know, good, solid German Bavarian Radio Studio <laughs> Sonics. Again, they're not demonstration quality, but they're very effective. But what makes this performance so special is that the prominence of the woodwinds, the freshness of the whole thing. I mean, Mahler's first is all about that in a way. You know, it's the opening is morning, it's dawn, it's dewy, it's fresh, it should be invigorating. The rusticity of the scherzo. And in the funeral march, Kubelik hit the, the, the klezmer, you know, Jewish dance music like nobody else had before, not even Bernstein. You know, with the trumpets particularly, the accents on the trumpets, da, 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 the trumpets come in, wa, da, 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 wa, da, da. I mean, they do it so well. It's so characterful. That's what this performance has. It has flavor. Lots and lots and lots of flavor. And so it really wasn't until 19, late 60s that there were enough Mahler firsts around and enough people cared about them, I think. And uh, they were getting distributed and sold and marketed so that we could make up our minds about critics could make up their minds about what the great versions were. And there was indeed a consensus that Kubelik's Mahler one was special. It was really, really, really special. Um, and I think that's remained the case. I mean, you know, we've talked about how in these reference recordings, you know, some of them are my favorites and a lot of them are not. Um, some of them are uh, because the fact that there's a consensus means that, you know, either either everybody likes them because they're good or they really are just great. <laughs> I mean, absolutely great. So obviously some of my faves are going to be some of the reference recordings, but some of them are not. And I really think that in this case, um, I have other Mahler ones that I that I listen to more frequently probably than this one, but this is without question one of my favorites. And it always has been for just those qualities I mentioned. And because when, because you hear those qualities immediately, you know how so many reviews and, and discussions of music are so namby-pamby. They talk about, oh, his phrasing is wonderful. Well, what does that mean? I have no freaking clue, frankly, what phrasing means. I, I know when melodies strike me, but but, you know, the details, you know, oh, they phrase, they do this, they do that. You know, it's like, it realizes the music's spiritual qualities. Yeah, right. Go ahead. You know, you know, and I've got some swampland in New Jersey I could sell you cheap if you're interested. You know, so much of the, the discussion of music is, is such bullshit. It's about just very impressionistic, waffly ideas. But with this performance, we were able to talk about some facts. You could talk about the trumpets. You could talk about the woodwinds. You could talk about the swiftness of the tempi, the urgency, the naturalness of the whole thing. And, and you hear it. You hear it right away. And that's the kind of discussion I like to have because at least, at least whether you like it or not, the musical facts speak for themselves. And I think that's an important thing. I think it's an important thing when you're talking about reference recordings. They're recordings whose musical individuality has to be has to be describable and 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 audible easily to a large number of people. Um, and this was a performance about which that was absolutely true. And it remains so. It's still a very special performance. Nothing sounds quite like it, even though there are, you know, performances with better brass sections that are louder and more exciting in some respects, you know, in terms of their impact. Um, the qualities that this performance has uh, are really special. And that's what made it the reference recording for Mahler 1. And it still is. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.